I'm very honored to be delivering this lecture in memory of one of our finest human rights lawyers and a fearless advocate for this community during his long and distinguished career. Whilst I didn't know PJ McGrory personally or have the privilege of meeting Paddy as he was known to my family, his name was often spoken warmly in our household when I was growing up. He had represented my relatives in relation to the inquest of Dan McCann, executed by the SAS alongside Maria Farrell and Sean Savage in Gibraltar on the 6th of March, 1988. Mr. McGrory was very much outnumbered and the underdog in the courtroom in Gibraltar. The British government, the government of Gibraltar, the SAS soldiers had separate legal teams. All parties to the inquest except Mr. McGrory had access to statements made by the SAS and MI5 personnel. Public interest immunity certificates also prevented him from probing the soldiers adequately under cross-examination. The legal concept of equality of arms requiring that a fair balance be afforded the parties to the inquest was absent from the proceedings. Not surprisingly, the inquest returned a verdict of lawful killing by a majority of nine to two. But he was not deterred by the flawed Gibraltar inquest verdict and took the case to the European Court of Human Rights. Mr. McCrory's tactical move would significantly change how future inquests were conducted. The decision known as McCann and others v. UK was a landmark case on the use of force by the state. The European Court of Human Rights held in 1985 that although there was no conspiracy to murder in Gibraltar, the planning and control operation was so flawed as to make the use of force almost inevitable. It was the first Article 2 right to life violation ruling in the European Court of Human Rights over 40 years after its establishment. Significantly, this judgment extended the scrutiny of the use of force to the planning of the operation and the examination of procedures for investigating the incident. Since the ruling, there has been a steady development in the understanding of Article 2 through the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. Many of those early judgments were cases involving state killings in the north of Ireland. The development of Article 2 procedural obligations has dramatically transformed the scope of inquest and has produced much more thorough, inclusive and satisfactory investigations of the use of lethal force by the state than their predecessors. This now means that when individuals are killed as a result of the use of force of the state, then the death should be subject to an effective investigation, which is capable of leading to the establishment of the facts of the situation is able to determine whether the use of force was or was not justified and identify and, if appropriate, punish those responsible. The incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic law via the Human Rights Act in 1988 was another significant milestone in the inquest process. The Act provides a remedy for breach of a convention right in the UK courts without the need to go to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. To quote Lord Justice Moses and RB Secretary of State for Transport, a 2006 case, long gone are the days of travel to some disparity in corner of some pancreas or Battersea, only be told peremptorily when appearing on behalf of the bereaved, keep quiet and sit down. Like Mr. McGrory, I've also had the privilege of representing victims of human rights abuses by the state, including the Balamorphy massacre families whose loved ones were shot dead by British soldiers over the course of three days in August 1971. The robust changes to the inquest system since the McCann judgment were pivotal and mad faces to the Balamorphy families when I first met them in 2009. In a crowded conference room in a city centre law firm, I set out my arguments succinctly, recommending an application for the inquest to a very sceptical audience. Their scepticism, of course, was very reasonable and laid of their understandable lack of confidence in the legal system. The original inquest in 1972 were perfunctory in nature, with open verdicts recorded. The soldiers involved in the shootings did not even attend the inquest and were not compellable witnesses. Instead, they would have provided the coroner with an unsworn written statement providing their account of the incident. In 1970, an agreement was reached between the General Officer Commanding the British Army and the Chief Constable of the RUC, which meant that the investigation of the use of lethal force by the military would be carried out by the Royal Military Police, another branch of the British Army family tree. The families of the deceased and their legal representatives also faced many insurmountable challenges before the original inquest even began. Legal aid was not available to them for representation of the inquest, Additionally, the families and legal representatives were disadvantaged due to lack of pre-inquest disclosure. 
depraved of documents pertaining to your case. The British legal system was not designed to deliver a scrupulous independent investigation that could result in an evidence-based finding of what happened to their loved ones. After much discussion and reflection, the Baltimore families decided to pursue the legal strategy that I had set out to them, perhaps more out of a paucity of options than any real expectations of a breakthrough. The transfer of police and injustice powers to the Stormont Assembly from Westminster, the final piece of the devolution jigsaw in February 2010, meant that the decision on a new inquest would be made by the local Attorney General, John Larkin, QC, rather than the British Attorney General. The Coroner's Act 1959 provided him with a broad discretion to direct a fresh inquest where he deemed it advisable. In 2010, I lodged the detailed submissions with the Attorney General and at a hastily arranged press conference at Corpus Christi Parish Hall on the 14th of November 2011, the Ballamurphy families announced to the world that their application for new inquest was granted by the Attorney General. It would take a further seven years and only after a legal challenge to the delay in funding the proceedings for the inquest to be heard. The Balmurphy inquest finally opened on the 12th of November 2018. It would sit for 100 days of evidence. Hundreds of civilian, police, military and expert witnesses would provide testimony to the inquest. Many statements from deceased witnesses or those who were granted medical excusal by the coroner were also read into the court under Rule 17. The Ballamurphy inquest would become the longest running and most high profile inquest in the legal jurisdiction's history. When the coroner Siobhan Justice Keegan announced her findings on the 11th of May 2021 that all 10 of the victims of the Ballamurphy massacre, Father Hugh Mullen, Frank Quinn, Daniel Taggart, Noel Phillips, Joseph Murphy, Joan Connolly, Edward Doherty, Joan Laverty, Joseph Core, and John McCurr were entirely innocent, that the force used by the soldiers was not justified and in breach of Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, it was a momentous occasion not only for the families, but also for the long-suffering Balmurphy community. These findings are proof that the inquest system has changed from a tool for the state to deflect criticism and avoid blame to an effective accountability mechanism and truth process. In my view, it is no coincidence that the British Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, has set out the British government proposals for dealing with the past only weeks after the Balmurphy findings. These proposals include a statute of limitations on the prosecution of any troubles related offences and the ending of all forms of investigations and judicial activity, including civil and coronial processes. The current investigative process would be replaced by an undefined information recovery process. It is precisely because the inquests have developed into the most effective judicial tool available to families that the British government are running scared of legacy inquests. There is no doubt that dealing with their past is a formidable task, but I don't believe an amnesty or information recovery process will produce, or indeed is intended to produce, specific evidence of past transgressions that would not have come to light otherwise. In fact, it will produce a much inferior process for grieved families. In support of this argument, I want to set out in practical terms some examples of how the Ballamurphy inquest accommodated the families and how judicial process helped us arrive at the truth. One of the most important developments of the ECHR jurisprudence has been the evolution of the procedural obligation under Article 2 to have an adequate public scrutiny and involvement of the next of kin in the proceedings. In the case of Jordan, the European Court of Human Rights stated that the next of kin of the victim must be involved in the procedure to the extent necessary to safeguard their legitimate interest. This procedural requirement greatly impacted the Ballamurphy family's experience of the inquest. Let me give you some examples. Legal aid was provided to the next of kin to ensure their full involvement in the inquest. The Ballamurphy families were represented by solicitors and a total of four Queen's, Queen's Council and six junior council. The families also engaged world-renowned pathology expert, Matt Curry, ballistic expert, Anne Kiernan, an engineer, Brian Murphy of TBM Consultants, to, to review the original autopsy reports and witness statements. The legal costs were covered by the Exceptional Grant Fund from Legal Services Commission, which is regulated by the Legal Aid and Coroners Act 2014. The practical arrangements at the court were family centered. The inquest took place in Court 12 at Lagan City Court, Belfast. This spacious courtroom seated 100 people in the public gallery 
which catered for both members of the public and family members of the deceased. The jury box was also allocated to close family members to facilitate the viewing of screened witnesses. There were three large screens in the courtroom for those in the gallery to follow proceedings as maps and photographs were shown regularly throughout the hearing. Hearing aids were also provided to family members and those from the public who had difficulty hearing. There was also a private room in Lagansay Court set aside for family members where they could take a break from the inquest proceedings to converse over tea and coffee. In addition, a professional counsellor was always at hand who could speak to the family members whenever they found the content of the proceedings difficult or distressing. The legal representatives of the families were also afforded significant disclosure, which was only limited by issues of public interest immunity, national security, and the need to protect life, safety, and privacy. This would have included military, police, and civilian witness statements, army logs, radio logs, pathology reports of the deceased, and accompanying handwritten notes of the pathologist. Relevant documents from the Public Records Office in Kew Gardens, new statements provided by military witnesses, and the HET investigation file. By the conclusion of the inquest, we were disclosed tens of thousands of pages of disclosure, somewhere around 200 Lever Arts folders. And by way of comparison, when the families had engaged with the HET process, they had only been disclosed an 89 page report, which was basically a regurgitation of the inquest papers and open source material, which was readily publicly available. The next of kin also had the opportunity to make representation on many legal issues, including the process of taking statements from military witnesses for the purposes of the inquest. We were concerned that the MOD were not independent and should not take statements from their own soldiers. To accommodate these concerns raised by the families, the coroner directed that a law firm, Field Fisher, be appointed to make, take the relevant statements. The family's legal representatives also made significant submissions with regards to the tracing exercise being used to identify soldiers involved in the various incidents under investigation by the coroner. The requirement to ensure public scrutiny was also met during the inquest as the press were fully accommodated in the courtroom. A simple Google search of the Ballamurphy inquest will display a litany of news articles covering the inquest proceedings, ranging from RTE, the Irish News, the Guardian, and the Belfast Telegraph. The BBC has a sole section on its website dedicated to the inquest. The Judiciary and I website established a special section online to provide information regarding the case and hearings during which the inquest was heard. And public access to the court was available at all times. Perhaps the most significant aspect of the inquest was the opportunity afforded to the family's legal representatives to examine witnesses, which is almost unique to a courtroom, and they could test the credibility of that evidence. This was especially important in a situation where the state was not abandoning its defense of history. For example, the MOD and their submissions to the inquest continued to claim that one of the possible scenarios for the coroner to consider was that Edward Doherty was a petal bomber. There is no doubt the quality of evidence produced in the courtroom is more reliable because it has been subject, subjected to the rigours of the legal processes. It was certainly preferable to information or allegations asserted in other forums where the highly developed rules of evidence do not exist. The examination of military witnesses in particular was crucial in advancing our legal strategy of exposing the culture of the parachute regiment and its propensity to cover up for the brutal action of its soldiers. This went as far as a soldier planting ammunition in the trousers of Daniel Taggart when he was brought to Henry Taggart Hall from the Mansfield after being shot. This disgraceful attempt to falsely incriminate Mr. Taggart was rightly rebutted in the findings of the inquest court, which stated, there is no evidence upon which it be open to the coroner to find that Mr. Taggart was in possession of ammunition at the time he was taken into Henry Taggart Hall. Some of the most significant evidence provided by soldiers was not offered voluntarily in their statement, but extracted through the examination of the witnesses by our counsel. The truth had been buried under a mountain of lies and deceit, and we had to excavate that truth. One of the most eagerly awaited days of the Balmorphy inquest was the examination by Michael Mansfield QC of General Robert Jackson. Jackson was one part of PRO in August 1971, and this would pit arguably the most high profile British Army general since the Second World War against one of the greatest courtroom advocates of his generation. 
Mr. Mansfield expertly probed General Jackson and exposed his role in the cover-up at Ballamurphy by providing misinformation to the media in the aftermath of the deaths of John Laverty and Joseph Core. The inquest also heard evidence from Sir General Geoffrey Howlett, who was commanding officer to Para on the 9th of August 1971, and the highest ranking soldier at Ballamurphy. The exchanges between our counsel and the senior military witness were very revealing. In his second day of evidence, when questioned by counsel, he stated that the actions of the civilians, including the first year from Knights of Malta, going to the aid of Frank Quinn and Father Mullen, amounted to associating with the IRA. There's no question in my mind that this mindset played a role in constructing Ballamurphy as a suspect community in the minds of senior soldiers and those further down the chain of command of the parachute regiment. General Howlett was also dismissive of the rules governing the use of force. The yellow card was issued to all soldiers in order to identify to them the circumstances in which they could deploy lethal force. Yet the commanding officer of two power had described the yellow card variously as only semi-relevant, not quite fit for purpose in the circumstances, and further remarked that, and I quote, I believe that they were not the perfect thing for the occasion after we had gone to war. The disregard for the rules governing the use of force also helped explain the many acts of brutality over the course of three days at Balmurphy and why soldiers were so quick to have recourse to firing lay rounds in circumstances where it was not justified. So Geoffrey Howlett wasn't the only soldier to testify to the mindset of the parachute regiment. Another military witness, M597, gave evidence to the overt hostility to the nicest community and the unwillingness of senior officers to reprimand and discipline by their soldiers. In August 1971, M597 was a member of two part A Company. He had joined the army in 1968 and remained a serving soldier of the Parachute Regiment for eight years. He would eventually obtain an early military discharge by payment of a fine, colloquially known as buying oneself in service. In his evidence to the inquest, he was asked to explain the hostility of the Parachute Regiment by Coroner's Council, and I quote his response. Sir, it was a combination of two things. It was the way they were talking to me, basically saying that anything out there that moves, we consider them to be in the IRA or associated with the IRA, and for that alone, they should be shot or could be shot. And also, when they're talking to me, there's three or four bodies close by, and they had no feeling, no respect. It was a joke to them. It was literally, it could have been for anything back there. It wasn't for human beings. It could have been anything. He continued, I can only talk about being on the ground with officers and with personnel, and I can tell you from the God's honest truth, had I gone out and shot two people over there and come back into that building after whatever they were doing, I doubt very much that I would have even gone to court because they would have covered me up or they would have protected me. That was the actual, that was how it was in the parachute regiment at the time, and I can only tell you what I believe, and that's what I believe, and I'm sorry that that's the case. The Balmurphy inquest also heard evidence from a member of the Loyalist stroke unionist community in relation to the death of Francis Quinn and Father Mullen. C3 was a witness who apparently came forward following an appeal from an action for community transformation on the Shankill Road for witnesses. He gave an initial account to Reby solicitors and thereafter made a statement to the coroner's service. He gave evidence on the 7th of May 2019 and left the court during the lunchtime adjournment, failing to return to complete his evidence. Thereafter, he made repeated attempts to be excused from returning to give evidence, ultimately returning and benefiting from special measures on the 9th of September 2018. There were many discrepancies in C3's account to Reby solicitors, and a later statement made to the inquest, including lo location of army firing positions and when they had commenced firing, and the actions of positioning of loyalist gunmen in the area. One notable discrepancy was his assertion in a statement to Reedy's solicitors that he remembered seeing the gunman, gunman shot, but couldn't say who shot him. In a statement to the coroner, he was clear that the gunman was shot by the army. There were further discrepancies when he gave his evidence in court. The C3's account of the actions of the priest before he was shot was more problematic to him. On his account, the priest had to step over a small wire fence to get to the gunman, and according to C3, he lifted his robes in order to do so. He then attended the injured man, essentially giving the man the last rates before lifting the gun. 
The description of the priest's clothes, clothes was designed to lend authenticity to his description of this man as a priest. But instead, it was his unravelling as a credible witness. Our Council of Carn Quinlivan, QC, skillfully exposed the glaring gaps in C3's evidence and his attempt to justify the killing of Father Mullen. And I'll read you an extract from the exchanges between our Council and C3. Carn Quinlivan, can I suggest to you that you're lying about your account to the priest? C3, why would I lie? Carn Quinlivan, for the reasons I've gone through earlier, and I don't intend to repeat them, you see, C3, we have the autopsy report from Father Mullen's death. And one of the things that happens in an autopsy is that they describe the clothes that the individual is wearing. Do you understand? C3, aha. Karen Quinlivan. And they describe the clothes that Father Mullen was wearing when he was shot and killed. He was wearing a black jacket, a black clerical shirt, and a white collar, and a pair of black trousers, a pair of black slip on shoes, black socks. C3, right? Karen Quinlivan. So the description you've given of the priest is inconsistent with what we know Father Mullen to have been wearing when he was shot. C3, well, as I said to you at the start of this, I'm here to tell you what I remember. I'm trying to do my best here. That's all I can do. Karen Quinlivan, C3, I'm suggesting that you're not trying to do your best here. What you're trying to do is malign Father Mullen and the other person shot and wounded or killed in the waste ground. C3, I'm not, I'm not. Karn Quinlivan continued, your description of the clothing is inaccurate because you obviously decided that's what priests were. If I give that description, it will lend some sense of authenticity to my account, essentially. C3, no, no. Without disclosure of the autopsy report and photos, the witness statement of C3, and without the opportunity, and this is crucial, to test the credibility of the evidence and the glaring inconsistencies in this witness's account in the courtroom, these malicious allegations by C3 may have gone unchallenged and untested in any information recovery process. The deviation from the formal processes of criminal and civil courts is a distinctly inferior method of ascertaining the truth. In the coroner's court, the quest for truth depends on evidence and on facts. It relies on the examination of witnesses. It abhors insinuations and unfounded allegations. There is access to disclosure and it relies on the right of all parties to present arguments and challenge arguments. The process is also transparent and open and public. Most importantly, the families are now central to that process. The Balmurphy inquest can be a model for how we deal with our difficult past. And it is also an example of how judicial decisions can help rebuild broken words. This, in this inquest is not only the path to truth, but is also a way to accountability and a better understanding of our difficult past. There are many objectionable aspects to the recent NIO document on dealing with the past, but paragraph 38 stood out for me. It stated that civil and colonial processes relating to the troubles involve an approach that can create obstacles to achieving wider reconciliation. This could not be further from the truth. There are many component parts to the concept of reconciliation. It can mean intercommunity reconciliation or reconciliation between the victims and the perpetrator of gross human rights violations in the context of post-conflict societies. There are other necessary conditions, in my opinion, to reconciliation, such as accountability and the development of a political culture that is respectful of the human rights principles, one in which the universal application of the rule of law is deeply valued and respected. These proposals by the British government undermine the rule of law and human rights principles. The stumbling block to reconciliation has, has not been the victims exercising their right to access to justice, but 50 years of the British government avoiding the truth. It is only through the law that the rule of law is restored. This is especially so in cases where the legal system has been employed by the state to deny abuses. The Balmurphy inquest process allowed the Balmurphy community to reclaim the values so wholly, so wholly undermined by internment on the 9th of August 1971 and the breakdown of the rule of law in the days that followed. As Bob Ferrance, who is a sole surviving prosecutor from the Nuremberg trials, has said, there could be no peace without justice, no justice without law, and no meaningful law without a court to decide what is lawful under any given circumstances. This is a sentiment I think that PJ McGroy might have agreed with. The transformation of the inquest process in the north of Ireland is an important part of Mr McGroy's remarkable legacy, 
as is his commitment to the law as a tool to challenge state abuses, the pursuit of truth, the protection and vindication of civil rights, the sine qua non of any society yearning for peace and stability. Before I finish, I want to say a word or two about the coroner, Justice Yvonne Keegan, and her role in the inquest. Human rights compliant legislation or helpful jurisprudence from the court, European Court of Human Rights do not guarantee a fair inquest or proper findings alone. As Preet Barra, a former Attorney General for the Southern District of New York said, the law is merely an instrument and without the involvement of human hands, it is a lifeless and uninspiring as a violin capped in case. There's no doubt that Justice Keegan put the family's front and centre of the inquest process, and this was best demonstrated by her decision to open the inquest with family testimonies. These testimonials were read out over the course of three emotive days and set the tone for the remainder of the inquest. Usually in a formal court setting, these elements of the witness experience are disallowed as they're not directly evidentially relevant. But this process afforded the families a chance to humanize their story and give the court a vivid picture of who their loved ones were. The injustices perpetuated at Ballamurphy in 1871 by the British Army also had one unintended consequences. It produced ferocious human rights campaigners such as Breach Voy, John Taggart, Pat Liam Quinn, Patsy Mullen, Jerry McGrattan, Kathleen McGarry, Anne Ferguson, Rita Banner, Carmel Quinn, Aileen McKeown, Janet Danley, Kieran Cahill, and many, many more. The bulk of the inquest witness testimonies put forward in our submissions to the Attorney General requesting a new inquest in 2010 consisted of statements obtained by the families after door-to-door -door inquiries and responses to witness, witness surveys organized by them. The families had become by default the investigators and the evidence gatherers as they were abandoned by the criminal justice agencies and the legal system. There were many difficult and distressing days for the families during the inquest, but one in particular stands out in my memory. Day 33 of the inquest, when the, Con the Conley family first heard in harrowing detail of how their mother was shot by a British soldier firing from the Henry Taggart Hall and died alone and in great pain just feet from a house where another woman inside was frantically trying to save her. Agnes Keenan O'Hare gave evidence at the inquest as to the recovery of Joan Conley's body from the man's field by British soldiers, describing Mrs Conley as being thrown into the army vehicle like a sack of potatoes. A sudden visceral cry came from the jury box next to me where the close family members were seated and it echoed around the courtroom. That sound of deep grief and pain will never leave me. The court had to raise to allow everyone in the courtroom to recompose themselves after the completion of her evidence. It was a reminder of how raw the hurt and loss was for the families, almost 50 years after losing their loved one. That hurt had been compounded by the demonization of their loved ones in the aftermath of their deaths. Throughout the entire inquest process, the good days and the bad, the families were unflinching in their support for each other. There's an old Irish saying, which is apt for the Balmurphy families, or skach akila a warren medini. Under the shelter of each other, people survive. The findings of the coroner, Justice Siobhan Keegan, are a testament to their irrepressible spirit, which never gave up the demand for the truth. They refuse to sit down and keep quiet. These findings are their legacy. Romila Malbuff.